Happy New Year. Um, I'm calling to order our Neighborhood Services and Education Committee. Um, and I think we have Ruth 
who will call um, roll. Or someone from from the clerk's office. Jimenez. Present. Owen. Here. Esparza. Esparza. Carrasco. Carrasco. Arenas. Here. We have quorum. Thank you. Wonderful. We um, are going to move straight into reports to committee as we have nothing um, under the other items. And uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure, Angel, who is going to begin this, this wonderful presentation on the Office of Racial Equity Work Plan Status Report. And this yep. is D1. Yeah, Chair Arenas, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, we'll, we'll kick this off with Sulma and the team, um, and we'll turn it right over to her. Great. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, Chair Arenas and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sulma Maciel. I'm the director of the Office of Racial Equity, and I'm here and excited to introduce the, the first of many status reports that will be coming your way. Um, I also want to introduce especially two staff members who are going to be co-presenting today, and that is Andrea Trong, the Racial Equity Manager, and Chris Cambesis, the Immigrant Affairs Manager. Um, the, the purpose of today's status report of the Office of Racial Equity, which includes a summary of a look back and a look forward to the next six months, it covers both streams of work, advancing racial equity and advancing immigrant inclusion and belonging. Um, the memorandum reflects and it starts off with a brief historical preview of when and how the conversations of racial equity commenced. Essentially, it started all with the courageous leadership of five council members who initiated the topic of inequities in the spring of 2019. Um, Councilmember Arenas, Carrasco, Esparza, Jimenez, and Perales issued a memo in April of 2019 that really, really cracked open the, the opportunities to have this conversation in a very public way. And that was pursued up until the establishment of the office in June of 2020. I'm happy to announce that the Office of Racial Equity is now fully staffed with high, six highly competent and compassionate people that I'm privileged to call colleagues. You'll hear from Chris and Andrea today. Um, they're going to delineate highlights of activities that have been essential for creating the foundational work uh, for the Office of Racial Equity, as well as the activities that are in progress related to the Welcoming San Jose Plan. We understand the significant responsibility the Office of Racial Equity has to support the city organization in making San Jose a place where all people live well, thrive, and prosper. And the collective work of the office and the engagement of city staff across all departments will deepen the organization's understanding of racial equity, inclusion, and belonging in ways that every department can make deliberate progress towards creating a San Jose that works for everyone. So today's presentation will look familiar as I've met with all of you over the last six months to share the key highlights of our office. What's different is, is the content. Um, it shows again that the six months worth of work in the first part of the fiscal year, as well as what's up, up ahead in the next six months. So with that, lead us off, Andrea. Thank you, Soma. I'll just wait for the, the presentation slides. Thank you, Chantal. And if we can go straight into slide uh, three, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you again to you all. Good afternoon, Chair Rennes, members of the committee and members of the public. My name is Andrea Trong and I am the Racial Equity Manager in the Office of Racial Equity. As Sulma mentioned, I'll be presenting on behalf of the racial equity work that our office has been working on these past six months and then a look ahead of what we have in progress and what we hope to accomplish by June of this year. As you all can see on your screen here, uh, you all may be aware of this framework. Uh, we in the Office of Racial Equity have adopted the GARE framework which several other jurisdictions have um, adopted as well. And it's created to advance racial equity through normalizing, organizing, and operationalizing. Normalizing looks like engaging in practices and activities that actively name the history of government and creating and maintaining racial inequities. 
Organizing is building capacity and structure to implement these practices and operationalizing is the implementation of racial equity tools and policies and practices that explicitly name racial equity. We also wanted to note that it's important we're using this framework and this framework leads with race, but it doesn't end with race and it also co considers other identity intersectionality. Next slide, please. For the racial equity work stream, uh, we have five objectives. Today, I will specifically be speaking on three objectives that the office is directly involved with. And as you can see here, such as develop and implement training and applied practices and program, which is normalizing, building the Office of Racial Equity's team and citywide infrastructure, which is through organizing and embedding equity in the budget process, which is operationalizing. I wanted to highlight these two other um, objectives that we have in our office and wanted to note that we're influencing the work and that the city is operationalizing this um, through a racial equity lens in the reimagining re safety and community economic recovery work. Our office continues to be partners in ensuring that a racial equity lens is being used and that we're coordinating with our respective colleagues in these projects. Next slide, please. I'm really happy to report um, we've had a lot of great progress in these past six months, six months, and in the next slide, I'll review just some key highlights of what that might look like in practice. As you can see on this slide, we're using a stoplight color system to reference our progress. Uh, green means that activities have been completed, yellow is in progress, and red refers to uh, not being started. If we can move to the next slide. So here, I will just kind of review some key highlights from our July to December accomplishments. Um, there are other several accomplishments and highlights in our accompanying memo, but I just wanted to kind of highlight a few. So under our develop and implement training objective, we executed two senior and executive staff racial equity workshops. Under our build uh, office of racial equity team and citywide infrastructure, we hired and onboarded one assistant to the city manager, myself, and one senior executive analyst, Dr. Andre Lockett. As you can see in these other three objectives, which we um, define as operationalizing the work, we have partnered with the budget office and completed results-based accountability. We've completed several ad hoc consultations with city departments and revised and launched a budgeting equity tool for this next fiscal year in partnership with the budget office. Uh, next slide. Moving on to what's in progress for our next six months and what we also hope to accomplish by June, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Again, it's through our kind of normalized, organized, operationalized framework. And in our no normalized uh, framework, we hope to develop training videos for city staff on racial equity terms and concepts. Under organized, we hope to have 100% of departments complete a racial equity action plan. And, and under operationalized, we hope to complete five results-based accountability to the career plans for city departments, and that 100% of departments submit a budgeting for equity worksheet. Again, um, our office is really thrilled that we're all fully staffed and as Fulma mentioned, um, and we're, we're looking forward to forming a solid foundation and infrastructure that would support and reinforce racial equity efforts for our city organization in the long term. I'll now pass it on to my colleague, Immigrant Affairs Manager, Chris Cambises, who will be sharing the great work that we're all doing in the office related to Immigrant Affairs. Thank you very much, Andrea. Good afternoon, Chair Reves, members of the committee and members of the public. As Andrea mentioned, my name is Chris Cambesis and I am the Immigrant Affairs Manager in the Office of Racial Equity. And it's my pleasure to walk you through an overview of the work of my team. Uh, so I would like to begin by first acknowledging that while the Office of Immigrant Affairs no longer exists as a separate entity, the work of the Immigrant Affairs team is closely embedded into the framework of the entire Office of Racial Equity which collectively recognizes that immigrant justice is racial justice and that these two concepts are completely inseparable. Um, the Immigrant Affairs team is tasked with advancing initiatives and activities to help build a welcoming city for the 40% of residents of our city who were born in another country. Uh, the central goal of this work is to assist immigrant communities, long-term residents and the city itself to build a welcoming community. And our vision is to facilitate and accelerate immigrant inclusion in civic, economic, linguistic, and social aspects of life in San Jose, while ensuring that all immigrant and refugee communities, regardless of their backgrounds or countries of origin, are engaged, respected, and have the opportunities to reach their fullest potential. Since the adoption of the Welcoming San Jose Plan 2.0, uh, by the City Council in June of 2021. Our work has been focused on the implementation of community-identified strategies 
across four pillars that comp uh, comprise the Welcoming San Jose plan, leadership and communications, access and engagement, education and economic opportunity, and safe communities. Uh, within these four pillars are three, 23 initial strategies uh, that have also, over the last uh, few months, been joined by a range of emerging challenges, crises, and opportunities, which have enhanced and broadened the scope of the team's work including the adoption of the strategies to address anti-Asian hate crimes that were adopted by the council in May of 2021, and the real-time changes uh, in the immigration landscape that we're all very familiar with. Next slide, please. So similar to the racial equity side of the house, we use a similar stoplight system in order to depict uh, our progress towards uh, achieving our objectives and key results. So under leadership and communications, we successfully achieved 10 out of 12 of the objectives and key results that we uh, set between July and December. Uh, in access engagement, it was eight out of 10. Uh, educational and economic opportunity, nine out of 12. And safe communities, about six out of 12, about half and half. Uh, all, uh, regardless of completion, all objectives and key results that we set are at the very least in progress and are ongoing. We'll discuss some of that here in just a bit. Next slide, please. Um, so I would like to uh, walk you through a few of the major accomplishments that uh, the Immigrant Affairs team has uh, had over the last uh, few months. Uh, this is by no means uh, comprehensive, but provides a snapshot of some of the work and the nature of the work that we've been doing. So we'll walk through each of the four pillars and highlight a few that fall into those groups. So under leadership and communications, I would really like to amplify the biweekly immigration briefing that we uh, developed in order to assist with uh, supporting Policymakers, members of the city council, internal leadership with uh, remaining informed about the work of the immigrant affairs team, as well as the work of immigrant serving community organizations in the community, um, allowing us to be able to highlight and spotlight upcoming events, important changes, uh, and also provide policy updates on an ongoing basis regarding immigration uh, policy and the ever shifting lines around immigration policy. Also in the leadership of communications, I want to uh, point out the launch of our educational campaign around the Central American Minor Program. Uh, our initial goal has been to reach 100 eligible families from El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala to inform them and notify them of the reopening of the program. And this is one of the major initiatives that will also be continuing to take forward uh, as well now that it has been launched. Under access and engagement, I would also like to spotlight our launch of our uh, monthly Facebook Live Immigrant Spotlight series, uh, which is an opportunity for us to, every single month, pick a topic in the immigration field uh, and amplify the work of community-based organizations that are focused on those issues and are providing services in the community for the information of not just ourselves internally, but for the broader community as a whole. So beginning in November uh, and uh, up till yesterday, we have hosted uh, our spotlight series covering topic of documented dreamers, the Central American Minor Program, uh, yesterday in uh, recognition of uh, National Slavery Human Trafficking Awareness Month, we discussed uh, service providers for foreign, victim, foreign survivors of human trafficking. Uh, and next month, in recognition of Black History Month, we'll be focusing on the, uh, the service organizations that are specifically working with Black immigrants in the city of San Jose. Additionally, I'd like to spotlight uh, the work that we have begun in partnership with USCIS to provide uh, workshops uh, that will support uh, city of San Jose employees and families and family members uh, with any immigration needs that they may have as well. Under education and economic opportunity, I want to uh, spotlight the collaboration that we've had with the Mayor's Office of Technology and Technological Innovation uh, in developing a pilot project that has assisted with resum resume preparation uh, and uh, job mentoring for newly arriving Afghan refugees. And under the Safe Communities Pillar, uh, certainly want to uh, continue to uplift and magnify the work that's been done in terms of the implementation of the 15 anti-Asian hate crime strategies 
and the work that the Immigrant Affairs team did in helping lead the city's participation in United Against Hate Week in November. Next slide, please. So similar to the accomplishments, this uh, yeah, slide here, fo focusing on what is in progress and what we have on the horizon for the Immigrant Affairs team represents just a snapshot of the work that we are doing. As you can imagine, across 23 different um, strategies and four pillars, plus the work of the anti-Asian hate crime strategies, uh, there's naturally quite a bit going on at any given point. Uh, but I do want to take the opportunity to highlight a few of uh, these items. So under leadership and communications, we're very much looking at how we continue to help build immigrant civic engagement. Uh, and we're exploring this through initial planning for participation in California Immigrant Day 2022, which is in May, and perhaps uh, designing a city hall immigrant advocacy day as well. Um, under access and engagement, we are very much deep in the work right now uh, with our community partners around naturalization workshops and events, particularly in the hopes that, fingers crossed, we may be able to have some of these in person uh, this later on this year. Uh, under education and economic opportunity, uh, we're very much exploring the various different entrepreneurship promotion programs that exist out there, in particular the Immigrant Rising Seed Grant uh, program, which provides funding to immigrant entrepreneurs, particularly undocumented immigrant entrepreneurs who are interested in starting their own businesses or expanding businesses. Um, and under safe communities, uh, we are going to be actively engaged with the American Red Cross on expanding preparedness training to immigrant communities and supporting the expansion of the Latino engagement teams, uh, as well as continuing to work with a range of service providers locally on issues such as you know, expa expanding awareness of the support services that exist uh, for foreign victims of human trafficking, uh, and expanding the, our collaboration with groups such as Cadre, which are working on development of a local rapid uh, language bank for use in emergency contexts. So with that, I will turn it back over to Suma. Great, thank you, Chris and Andrea for summarizing the status report. Um, in just a few short months, you have landed with the city of San Jose and started running. And so much, so much respect and admiration for you both. As described in the memo, all areas of the equity framework are in motion, steadily moving the organization from early stage to growth stage. And while there is so much more work to do to eliminate racial disparities and reverse the effects of redlining on communities forced to live there, the city is making progress to that end. The Office of Racial Equity is laying the foundation for the Marathon Ahead and sustainable long-term change management while simultaneously supporting the city with the urgent needs. And there are already many bright spots throughout the organization where staff are critically thinking about the impacts of program design and service delivery, embarking on a learning agenda, rethinking data sets, both qualitative and quantitative, skill building on equitable community engagement, building a trauma-informed and resilience-oriented culture, improving access for people with disabilities, and so on. In addition, the implementation of the Welcoming San Jose Plan is an excellent example of operationalizing racial equity, centering the experiences of immigrants and refugees, and approaching the work with humility and ongoing learning. With that, I hope that this provides, um, you know, again, this was a snapshot of the activities that have been undertaken in the, in, um, the last several months uh, with a relatively new team. Um, at this point, we will take your questions um, and we hope that you will accept the status report of the Office of Racial Equity and cross-reference it to the February City Council meeting. Great, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Ruth or somebody from our city clerk's office so that we can go into public comment. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. And that's very important that I declare that I'm from the Horseshoe. The Horseshoe was D11. On the redlining maps of 1939, D11 was the absolute lowest. A, 1 through 11, B, 1 through 11, C, 1 through 11, D, 1 through 11, 
Paul Soto horseshoe. So I was the most deprived cops under over policing, under policing. We we know what happened. I'm very, I mean, extremely saddened that this report was the way that it was created because I bring a unique experience to this topic. Why? Because I fought for the budget. I was in the room. I was in the room when Stephen Petey talked about 200 years of Samho history. And I heard my elders in the audience weeping silently. You know who was absent from that audience? Vietnamese, Chinese, they were both absent. They didn't care. They did not care. I ain't mad at them. That's cool. I don't take that personal. But now you're going to come and side bust on, 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 on what it is that is absolutely a moral, legal, and ethical question as to whether or not I deserve to have a reparation for what I was forced to endure. Cultural genocide. My mother was beaten for speaking Spanish in the schools. Every single time a human being speaks Spanish now, I get angry because I cannot speak the language because they beat it out of my mother. I don't see my mother reflected in these documents. I am a Chicano, I am a Mexican American, and I want to see myself and my mother reflected in these documents. We were not immigrants. Claire Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for your, for the meeting today. This this can hopefully be a very uh, special meeting, a good way to prepare for 2022. Thank you. Um, you know, these ideas of equity have been developing here in San Jose and throughout the West Coast, actually, uh, for the past few years, before the George Floyd incident, before COVID, uh, we were building something just I think importantly sustainable and we can still do those efforts. Uh, thank you for this item and what you'll be, what we're trying to do. Uh, the ideas of equity and budgeting. Uh, Councilperson Perales was able to talk about right when COVID was, was striking as a way to be prepared for basically, I mean, these are our better practices uh, as, as a society, I feel. Um, we're trying in the past few years to really hone down what equity could mean and good luck in our ways to just better and better define the term and bring it to its uh, good beginnings. You know, people who are, who don't have, who are not offered choices, who don't have choices, who are not allowed choices, basically, we're trying to find ways that they can have choices and the same choices that uh, tends to be that, that, that rich people can have that people of higher incomes can have and that lower incomes cannot. If we focus on those terms, uh, we're on the way to just talking about equity and better terms in our future. So good luck how we can bring it to, the, to our original good definitions and uh, a good luck to ourselves in, in continued good efforts. And uh, I guess that's about all for now. Thank you. Jill Borders. Hi, I apologize. I missed uh, part of the presentation, so you may have covered it. Um, but what I'm really, really interested in, and in when we talk about racial equity, is I would, I would really hope that somewhere along the line, people like me. I was born here and raised here in San Jose, as was my mother. I have all of my grandparents, all four grandparents, are uh, buried in, you know, um, Oak Hill Cemetery. I feel very, very attached to San Jose, but I recognize that my experience, my lived experience all these years, as was my parents and my grandparents, apparently was very, very different than so many others. And without getting too much into race, all of the ignorance that I have, I am so prepared to shed it. But I listen to these meetings and for example, Paul Soto, Blair Beekman, people inform me so much more oftentimes in two minutes of sort of the pinpoints and the touch points of what I need to be educated about in San Jose. Um, I learned so much from the redistricting meetings, all of the comments. They really pinpointed for me what I need to become educated on and what's what I need to know 
to have change occur. I am so for reparations in all different forms for all different various groups that have been um, discriminated against, been just horrifically treated in the past. So I'm, I'm hoping that there can be at some point something that we might call, for example, a truth and reconciliation. Um, meeting on a regular basis where people like Paul Soto can come and share, not in two minutes, but given 15 minutes so that I can understand his experience. I can mourn with him. I can learn what I have to do to be a better citizen and, and to make those reparations happen. I'm ready for healing. I would love a truth and reconciliation meeting somehow, somewhere, maybe once a month, people can come and just share their stories. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great, thank you. I see um, Council Member Jimenez. Thank you. Just ha I have a quick question, but first let me just uh, say that I, I appreciate uh, Zuma, you, you and your team's work on all this. I, I you know, I, I read the memo and there, there's a lot of intricacies to this, even though, you know, as we sometimes just say equity and throw out that word as if, or racial equity, as if it's something simple, and, and and I think it's just complicated, but but important work that needs to be done. So I commend you for everything you all have been doing to move this issue forward. Um, the one question I have sort of stems from what I saw in a report from on another item in this meeting, and that is some of the work from the library uh, uh, department, San Jose Public Library, and that, that the idea around affinity groups. Um, and, and I'm curious what you think the role of affinity groups play in the city. And I'm curious if your, your department has, has one, how, how, how many of those exist within the city, if you have a number, but to the extent you think they're important, curious what your department is doing to try to move the, forward the expansion of those and the realization of more of those groups. Thank you, Council Member Jimenez, for the, for the question. Um, I'm actually grateful to the HR department. The Human Resources Department is the one that has led the charge um, yeah. over the last couple of years. They've initiated the affinity groups and have created the space for um, city staff members to participate in them. Um, I can't give you the number off the top of my head. If anyone on my team knows what that is, um, you know, feel free to chime in. But those are in motion now, um, and some okay. are much more active than others. But I'd be happy to get that info for you. Okay, okay, very cool. Yeah, and the number wasn't, I was just, if you had it, but it's not, it's not a big deal. If you can, if you can get the number to me at some point, that'd be helpful. I guess I'm wondering, you know, affinity groups can come in all different forms, right? And, and, and have an affinity for different things. <laughs> I guess specifically, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, racial affinity groups, if you will, right? For Latino or Vietnamese and things of that nature. I assume <clears throat> that it, that's, Part, part and parcel of some of the groups that have emerged, right, or have been helped sort of to move forward by the HR department? That's correct. In fact, that was one of the original goals from the, um, the very first GARE cohort, okay. to say that we needed to reignite that effort in the city of San Jose. And so HR took the lead on ensuring that the affinity groups represented um, the ethnicities of the organization. So. Right. And then so, so just to better understand the structure, so HR is helping to facilitate the creation or the establishment of these, um, for example, the, the, uh, just the library department, you know, the library, given that it's part of this, this meeting, um, they have an internal team that's leading those affinity groups. Is each department, in your view, uh, sort of taking the lead as it relates to their respective affinity groups, or are there larger affinity groups within the whole infrastructure of the city or, or how, what is the structure there? Yeah, so I think um, from what I understand, the, the, there are the larger groups, right, that are multiple departments um, represented in a particular affinity group, for example, mm -hmm. Latino, Native, yep. uh, Black, African ancestry, and so on. And um, the very specific groups, there are, there could be some departments that I'm unaware of that have very specific affinity groups within their departments. Um, but many of them are begin well. You what you saw in the report are beginning to mobilize around the racial equity action teams, um, which are a diverse mm -hmm. group of people trying to right. move this work forward. But there could be. So I'm, I'm not saying that there aren't. There okay. could be very specific ones to departments. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. Thank you for for the answers. And you know, this stood out to me just because uh, I think uh, you know 
attracting and retaining employees, for example, and job satisfaction, all that sort of goes hand in hand with affinity groups and promoting diversity, cultural awareness, and inclusive work environment and all those things. Uh, and I suspect it probably increases job satisfaction when folks, you know, typically it's often the time that folks are at jobs and careers and they mainly stay in one place when they like the people they work with, right? And facilitating some of these conversations, I think, is important, even within these groups that may be siloed to a certain extent, but then expand out and, you know, in, in my mind, create and foster the self-knowledge of even who they are, right? Because even that's challenging sometimes. But, uh, but anyway, thank you for the answer. Appreciate all the work you guys are doing, uh, Andrea and, and Chris. Uh, and, um, you know, on this topic of, of uh, racial equity, I've often, and I've expressed this to you, uh, Zulma, is that, you know, it's difficult work and, and I'm, I'm more of the mind that I'd prefer to go a little slower and do it right than try to speed through this. And so I appreciate the, the very uh, thoughtful approach that you've taken to building a team first and then, you know, taking these very logical steps. Uh, Cause I know we want to get to the finish line and live in a world and, and, and operate within a city and a society that, uh, that, that has reached everything that uh, uh, I think one of the commentators was touching on, right? Uh, this sort of self-actualization and everyone sort of being on the same page and having equity and, and opportunities, but uh, it's going to take time. And, and I'm appreciative of very, again, the very thoughtful approach that you guys put forward. So thank you. Great. Council member Esparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a couple of comments. Um, one is uh, I, I'm actually going to disagree a little with my colleague and that uh, I don't think we have the luxury of going slower, um, particularly representing a district that has been hard hit economically and health wise uh, by COVID, which has really widened uh, it, it gaps, canyons, really, that were already there to begin with, um, I don't think we have a lot of time. Um, I think that people are suffering now. People are becoming more and more disenfranchised now. Um, and there is a physical, very real cost to not meeting those needs systemically. And so um, I uh, wanted to ask a question around um, the budget process. Um, I know that uh, that has started, and I wanna say, what is it? Uh, it's mentioned in the memo that it's in process in terms of the budget tools um, and providing technical assistance on department specific um, uh, racial equity teams, but also in terms of uh, the budget support and the tool um, I'm, I've heard from, there are some departments that we're focusing on and, um, I'd like to hear an update on where we're at with that. And, and I'm, I'll ask this, um, you know, in front of the full council as well, but I just think it's important to bring this out now because we are in the budget process right now. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Council member Esparza. Excellent question. Cause we are in the middle of that now. Um, the team has created a budgeting for equity tool, which every department is required to, to complete and submit related to a core service area. That's one piece for that's citywide. The second piece is around what we're testing now, results-based accountability. And um, there are eight departments that we're taking through a very deep dive related to embedding equity on particular performance measures. Um, that they have and being able to tell a story about how are people better off as a result of your services. Um, and so more on that will be coming in form of an MBA related to what did we learn in terms of, you know, we're going to evaluate it, iterate it, and see, you know, where, where did we learn and how can we, act, how can we produce and embed this across the city? So we decided to start small so that we can scale, um, but super excited to see some of the initial results from that, from that exercise. Andrea, do you have anything else to add? Um, to Sulma's point, these eight departments that are selected are both uh, community facing as well as some strategic support. And as Sulma mentioned, starting small helps us because the results based accountability framework does often take a lot of time and understanding to implement and understand and especially how many performance measures that we have in the city. We also in tandem, as Sulma mentioned, are launching the budgeting for equity tool as a process is because 
As you mentioned, uh, Council Member Esparza, the urgency is great, and we believe that uh, our budgeting for equity tool and process is still a great way to engage our departments to think with a racial equity lens. And therefore, we know a lot of our uh, departments need a lot of support and consultations. And so we've offered our own staff and our own time to also provide technical assistance to them so that they have all the tools that they need to be successful in completing a budgeting for equity worksheet as well. Thank you. Um, and I, uh, and actually you brought up uh, something I also wanted to address in terms of some of the work that we've already done in terms of um, leadership training. I had a question about ongoing technical assistance uh, specifically for leadership and management, although I think it's needed sort of at all levels because we have, we need to empower frontline staff more as well. But um, I do think it's needed. And, and I'll say again that, um, you know, when we talked about the definition at council, it was frustrating to, you know, all this time later to talk about a definition, but having, um, having experienced uh, the use of equity as uh, as a as a tool to really maintain the status quo was which just illustrated the need for for to have a common language around a definition. But my question is around <clears throat> this ongoing support for leadership um, within the city as they develop uh, team based tools, and you know we're doing all this other work on budgeting. How are we supporting our leadership? so that we help them maintain that equity-based approach? Yeah, there's a couple of things that we have on the horizon, council member, related to not only increasing the understanding and awareness about this work, but also their understanding and awareness about their role in advancing this work. Um, and so there are some key things. We, as the Office of Racial Equity, have um, are planning some additional trainings to kind of jump off some of the trainings that we did in the last six months to keep it in front and fresh in front of them, number one. Number two, we are in the process of designing um, some video trainings or like bite-sized trainings that are short that people can opt in on for various terminology, concepts, frameworks, and then revisit them as often as they can. Um, but we also are, you know, we, the, the training that we want to do with the consultant will be citywide. And so keep that um, in front of everyone, especially leadership and middle management, because much of the change management happens there, right? And so um, main, it's not just a one-off training. It's sort of this maintaining a learning environment from here on until, who knows, perpetuity, right? So we don't intend that this would be a one-off training. It's a series of trainings to build skills, build capacity, and socialize what we're doing here so that it truly is embedded in the way that we speak about it every day and that everybody understands, Council Member, like you said, you, when they use the word equity, racial equity, they actually know what, you know what they mean by that and be able to provide you know, clear examples of what that looks like at the community level. Yeah, yeah, Council Member, if I could also add, in addition to what, what you just heard, um, we've also just recently completed, uh, put the entire senior management team through two pretty intensive trainings uh, around this very subject, right? Because we, we recognize that, you know, it, it's not enough to just talk about it. We, we need to embed this in, into the culture of our organization. Um, and in fact, as a senior management team, we went through a facilitated process of really redefining our leadership values and equity is front and center in that for the first time. Uh, equity has never been called out specifically as a leadership value in terms of the senior management team. So that, that's, I think, another step in the right direction. Uh, and then we're going to continue this training at that level to make sure that that. Uh, 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 you know, representatives from the city manager's office, for, you know, uh, uh, directors of, of, uh, of departments are leading and driving this and supporting the efforts of frontline uh, and, and middle management staff, right? Because it has to be the entire organization moving in tandem. Uh, we recognize we're not all always going to be able to move at the same speed and at the same, you know, uh, but we want to make sure that we're moving definitely in the direction of implementing uh, race and equity as a framework in terms of the way we do all our work in the city of San Jose. Yeah, that's that, uh, that's helpful. And and um, and it's interesting that you say that too, because 
and I'll, I'll use PRNS as an example because they're, I think, the example for the city um, in, that the, in so many ways, but including in the, the high number of employees that live in the city. And we've leaned on them so much in COVID response and census um, and other things because they know our neighborhoods. Um, they're, they're such a part of the community and bring that different perspective, particularly from frontline staff. Right. And um, and and I'm not picking on them because that's a department head that lives in San Jose as well. Um, you know, uh, so but uh, but so often our frontline staff bring that history, bring that experience um, in the neighborhoods. And, and we did this with census. And I know because Councilmember Carrasco's staff and her, she and her staff and I and my staff, we were out there with um, PRNS folks. It, this was these were their neighborhoods, right? Not only the neighborhoods that they worked in, but these were their neighborhoods. And so there's so much more that they understand. Um, and not only should we empower them to come up with good ideas because they're the ones doing the work, but uh, they're the ones who actually have so often come from the very communities that we're trying to serve, right? And so there are lots of different reasons that we should find ways to empower them. And and lastly, I'm just I'm going to get on the soapbox just a little bit on the um, law enforcement part of it. Um, uh, because we're providing training on racial equity to law enforcement. Are we providing um, consistent language and training for other uh, city departments that, that uh, and, and I'm bringing this up because I'm a believer, I have no problem saying this, I'm a believer in the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force work. It's a national model. It's um, something that, in my opinion, the city should be investing more in. Um, and, uh, and so, and that partner, that effort is based on city or county nonprofits um, and law enforcement, right? Everybody comes in to play. Are we doing a common training and a common language and a common understanding of what we expect among um, not just frontline law enforcement, but frankly, the groups that they can um, do and hopefully work more closely with? Council Member Esparza, the, um, there is, we've had to solicit the help of a consultant that has had um, experience working with law enforcement, specifically on racial equity. And when we went through that procurement process, we interviewed several that said that they had done that, but there was only one that we found in the country that explicitly um, you know, leads with race and understands these concepts of racial equity and the frameworks related to law enforcement. And so that training, um, that consultant is someone that we'll be working with shortly. Um, there's been a stall on the agreement, but that's besides the point. Um, and so I, I agree with you. I mean, it was difficult to find um, a consultant that would be able to use sort of the same vernacular that we're using and be able to spell out um, in ways that law enforcement can understand what the expectations are when we mean advancing racial equity and the ways that um, that shows up, you know, in law enforcement. So having her content expertise, as well as this overlay of um, understanding the racial equity world will, will be important in that. But I really like your idea about beyond law enforcement, sort of the, the network of partners, you know, are we all Kind of speaking the same language and i think that that is something we need to consider more um you know thinking about how we extend the type these types of trainings to our partners as well so thank you for the idea yeah and i bring that up because um I, you know I, I i've said it especially in regards to best and that uh, other work and and i'm just i'm using them as an example because i think they're the example that we have they're a successful example um but so often when we talk about other community investment as either alternatives or as in partnership with law enforcement, um, we need to bolster those programs. Again, they need to have the same language, the same training, the same transparency and accountability, right? And so um, if we want these efforts to um, work together, then this might be a way to start um, getting all, the, all this work uh, moving in that same direction. 
That's it for me, Chair. Thanks. I take it back. I do it. We need to accept and refer the report. I move to accept and refer the report. Awesome. Second. Wonderful. All right. So before we take um, that vote, I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask. Um, I'm really happy that we're we're beginning to have these conversations um, uh, because I was looking at the dates and it's almost been two years since we've kind of collectively had this conversation. And since then, we've had, you know, like a, a lot of civic um, demonstrations, and we've had a pandemic, and I don't know what else we, we, we're going to face, but we've been facing it together, and we've been making this work, and uh, I really appreciate that now we are having a more strategic approach to the work that we're having. Um, one of the things that, that I want us to make sure that, that we do is not only work with what what has been happening in the last two years, um, you know, the results of the pandemic, I think my council colleagues uh, have expressed that, but also the, um, the historical experiences of the folks who've been living here. And I think there's a lot of value in having some of those conversations publicly and to demonstrate how do we have these conversations with each other and acknowledge um, the suffering and, and the, um, uh, the suppression of certain groups. Um, I, I want to say that almost every group that, that immigrated to the U.S. had their their turn, if you will, unless you you were from England. And even when you were from England, there was some subgroups from there. Um, and so, not that it makes it any better, but we have to recognize that history. And for for California, just like everywhere else, that is to recognize slavery and to, and to speak about that that um, issue. I mean, you know, if, if South Africa could do this in, you know, that horrendous situation, we can certainly do that and have this kind of um, reparations discussion as well. Um, and then, of course, we're in California, which is <laughs> which is used to be uh, former Mexico. Um, and we can't ignore that. I mean, the majority of the names of their cities and our streets are all Spanish surnames. And so we have to also recognize that in San Jose, we may have a larger Latino community, but uh, we also have folks who've, who've been part of, of San Jose and we've recognized them. We had a recognition and an apology to our, our Chinese American community. I think in that same way, we need to be very strategic about the rest of the groups um, uh, and not as a special, you know, date uh, comes up, but I think we should plan for it and, and plan to recognize these groups, bring in the, some of the, the Native American history as well um, from those folks um, and have a discussion. Because I think, you know, as much as I would love for us to move into um, normalizing, you know, we are, we are, uh, uh, or operationalizing, excuse me, we're in normalizing, that we, we haven't even really scratched the surface. And, and we have to also recognize that those demonstrations of the people in the streets allowed us to have this very honest conversation because it wasn't so two years ago with our colleagues. I can say race um, with my colleagues without stirring up um, and having them think that I was saying racist. Um, and so we have to recognize that. Otherwise, I think we're really stepping over um, the process and just jumping into um, the infrastructure, which I think is absolutely important. I think we need to be strategic, but I think we also need to recognize who's here. And the folks who immigrate to our city, you know, our large uh, Vietnamese community, our large Filipino community, our Southeast Asian community, we, we just need to recognize those folks. And I don't, I don't see that necessarily being part of that, um, other than maybe what the um, the groups themselves are doing for each other in in their respective community. And so, if there is a missing group, how do we how do we um, plan for that? Is there, have you had any discussions about this concept that I'm presenting? Yes, uh, we have, you know, it's come up 
quite a bit because part of um, acknowledging the history also requires a space for healing. And, um, you know, we've been so focused on just trying to get the organization up to speed and, and address the urgent needs in the community as a result of the pandemic and everything else that we have not paused to do that. Um, but it, it also is an opportunity to work with partners like the National Compadres Network who are subject matter experts and who have a lot of experience in facilitating these kinds of dialogues where you create the space for racial healing. Um, but the racial healing is first having a, a dialogue and a conversation about the historical inequities. And so, um, you know, we wanna do that well. It's not something you, you just wanna throw together and see who, who shows up, but you wanna make sure that that's facilitated well. So comes from Marenas, it has been on our mind. It's just, um, we have not been able to create the, the space on our work plan to do that, but we understand and we hear more about this almost mm -hmm. every day that, that there's a need and there's a desire to, mm -hmm. to have a space. And so who leads it primarily? I think it could be a, a number of partners that get together and decide how we carry out that part of the work. Well, I think it's our responsibility as a city to also lead that conversation um, of course, relying on the expertise of those who, who've built relationships with certain um, groups. But I think it's, it's, it, um, it's part of our, our government, the results of a lot of policies, the results, you know, this society didn't happen on accident. So I really would like to see us lead on that a little bit more um, than what we have been, um, because this part of the conversation, I think, pulls people in and allows for some of that um, participation that I think people are just really yearning for, um, that recognition um, and that healing, right? So we can move to to the healing piece of this, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, I don't know how long that would take, but whatever, how long uh, that would be, but we need to begin to have these conversations. Otherwise, um, I think if we get to to um, technical and, and, and clinical about these are the steps that Gare has outlined and this is what we need to do, then I don't know that we're honoring the voices of those folks who are here. Um, so let, I, I'm not going to um, continue on with that. We can take it offline a little bit. I just love, I would love to see this. You, you hear some folks um, and, you know, and I was telling my son about this the other day because he heard Paul Soto have, you know, some of the comments that he was, uh, that typically we hear uh, from Paul Soto and and um, and the historical uh, suppression of language. Um, and my son said, why would they hit his mother? You know, why would they, he, he, he made a comment like you heard earlier. And so then I had to sit down and talk with my son about, you know what, for Latinos, you literally would get paddled and you would be beaten by an administrator, a teacher, somebody you think that you should respect um, be, and so that you don't have this attachment to this language so that, that we can become this melting pot that we don't, we've learned does not work. And so I think there's a lot of, um, I think there, there needs to be um, when either what, whether we need to be that for our community that needs to happen and we need to have um, we need to make sure that we have it for the different groups. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, we just need to have the conversa conversation because uh, each of those conversations will be very different. Um, and um, okay, so let me let me get the uh, get to some of my other questions. I was just thinking about this as as uh, my colleagues were talking. I was thinking about the community engagement framework that you have, um, and how that would um, align with the promotoras framework that was approved in our budget. And any thoughts on how that? Well, there's true alignment with that. So members of the community engagement work group um, use that type of frame to ensure that community engagement is not extractive, but that it's collaborative, mm -hmm. that it, um, it, it, it shares power and that it's right. not just a one-way street. Right. Um, so exactly what you're saying, that that model is a model that works. And so um, I think that the thing for the city is making sure, you know, that we adopt a, a framework that we all, um, you know, adhere by and, and hold some integrity to it. 
and, mm -hmm. and that takes uh, some buy-in as well as some training because not everybody knows how to do that well, right. right? And so the last thing we want to do is say, we're going to adopt this framework and not provide any capacity building for people to actually do this really well and ensure access and inclusion all the way around. Um, so I would like to see how the immigrant affairs uh, team can engage um, with, with this uh, promotoras a model, or you know, I'm not going to say exactly whom, what part of your team does this, but I'd like to see how the, uh, your your team um, can see an opportunity for these alignments for the promotoras um, model and framework, um, taking into consideration all the you know all of the objectives that you've laid out for yourselves, um, which I know is they're all very huge. Um, and I have a, a lot more questions, but I'm going to hold off and um, on my on my on my questions here. Um, I was thinking about the non-citizen voting discussion that we had the other day on, on Tuesday, which was very controversial. But at the same time, just you know, it, we all benefit from having these kinds of interactions and and exchanges of ideas, and so. How would you see, um, or would you see a role, um, your team having a role in that, maybe in the study session, or how would you see that? I don't, I don't know um, at the moment. I mean, I know a study session is being planned um, because there are, a lot of it is understanding also the mechanics of this because it's very complex. Um, it's a very complex issue. So um, I think for now, you know, we're, we're aware of what some of the other cities have done. And, um, you know, I can't commit my team because of bandwidth right now, but I think part of it is also the research. And we have colleagues in, in cities across the U.S., particularly New York and San Francisco that have done some of this related to school districts in their areas and, and expanding power, um, expanding voting power in those areas. So. Um, you know, that's, I think there's more to, to discuss internally about what the role of office racial equity is on that. Yeah, I have a, I have a, um, and, well, I used to have somebody on my team and he, he started out as an intern and became a, a, a team member, but he is now interning for the Brennan Center for Justice and, and, um, and he heard about this and said, oh my gosh, are you guys discussing this? Are you talking about this? So, you know, there's different parts of the country that are looking at us um, for that level of leadership. And I think this is an opportunity for <clears throat> OER to, to take that up. Um, and so if, if maybe um, when the motion is made that we can integrate um, some of this alignment of what we're already doing with, uh, in terms of the promotoras, um, framework that you know and that's already funded that could be something that could be helpful uh, for ORE um, obviously um, related to um, uh, to the work that you're doing but but there's so much that could um, that could intersect here um, and so that you leverage all of the resources that it may not be within your team but it's definitely within the resources of the city right Okay, the, the other thing I just wanna, um, I want to also express is ongoing training for um, policymakers. Um, yes, and this is for you know, folks like myself, we need to continue to learn and, um, and, uh, and not just recognize how our systems are institutionalizing racism, but how to um, effectively be anti-racist um, by developing policies in a way that can answer um, or undo some of this some of this harm that we've had before. I heard you. I heard what you said to um, Councilmember Esparza. And I'm wondering, is there has there been any level of an analysis for each of the departments that recognize this is what how we've institutionalized racism within our department? This is how we, this is how our system did this. Not necessarily that they're implementing that, but but there's remnants of that. And I'll uh, give you an example. Uh, PRNS has be, you know before and this is a, an economic decision that was made because of the recession to close down community centers. And obviously they are a um, cost recovery 
Um, but that's not their fault. It's our fault as policymakers, as previous policymakers, not to put value in 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 those types of services so that they're not cost recovery, um, but that that just core to to our services. And so they're moving into a um, in a direction where they're place based, where the services are needed. That's where they're responsive. Not not that they haven't been doing that before, but the, with the ARP funding that allows them to to do a little bit more of that type of work um, and to um, not have programs just because they're cost recovery in certain places, but to offer the, the programs based on that need. Are we having that those level of discussions in other um, departments? How, how are we, how are those departments recognizing that? Yeah, so, you know, that is part of the work. So this work resides in the departments. And, you know, I haven't personally done a scan of all of those things that the city of San, or the city of San Jose went wrong. Um, but I think that that's part of the work is where the departments are beginning to uncover that. And, and, and so this, this, is why, this is why we need to work with, you know, the, the normalizing and socializing is important, but working with urgency so that people have a skill level to be able to do a root cause analysis and be able to uncover that, right? So we, the the, off, the small office hasn't had a, you know, hasn't gone department by department to do an analysis like that, but we wanna teach others how to do mm -hmm. that. Yes, I, I did see, I'm not gonna move too far ahead because I know the next item, it has more to do with our library department and the way that they're leading in this area is admirable. Um, and we have to figure out whether, you know, how, how can we also move other departments in the same way? They're um, um, very enthusiastic about uh, moving towards um, equity and recognizing race within um, their institution and even have somebody assigned to that. But the value is based on that leadership, right? And so how much resources you put into that. And I think that we need to have a baseline in terms of this is at least what we we need to have a recognition of these these things um, as part of that analysis. And I appreciate you saying that that, um, that there would be this root analysis from some of the departments. I look forward to seeing what those work plans look like, um, because even though that each of those um, directors are are leaders in their own department. Um, they're not, they don't lead in a vacuum, right? Um, and, uh, and ORE, I would imagine would need to, or I would like for ORE to, to have that level of requirement from the departments to do their analysis to a certain point where, where it's, it brings real value in the everyday business of, of those uh, departments and divisions. And what that would look like, I'm not sure, you know, you tell me what you would expect from each of those uh, departments. Um, and we can continue this conversation offline, but I would like to see that 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 level of, of baseline. Um, and, and I know the best practice were, is going to be really different for a library department than it is going to be for a uh, department of transportation, completely recognize that, but I think there's some some baselines that we we need to expect from folks. Okay, so those are those are my my questions. Um, I I think they're there. You've done such wonderful work in terms of bringing us to this point. Um, obviously, this is such an important um, issue and item to discuss and to implement and to uh, discover with each other that we've uh, dedicated a whole NSC meeting to it, right? Um, and and our conversations are not complete because we have two more items that um, are inclusive of this of this um, item. And, and before I, I completely move on, here's another alignment that I wanted to have. So in December, we had in the PISFIS and the Public Safety Strategic Support uh, and Finance uh, Committee that I sit on, um, there, it, there was a um, conversation about, or an item that was, uh, or there was a report that was provided regarding some of the hate crimes in that overview. Um, I know that we, and I supported this because I want to make sure that I'm, um, I'm not, I am as supportive as I um, can be to our API. 
community when um, the call comes, it doesn't really matter who they are. We, we are going to stand up for our community. Um, they're a huge part of my, of my district as well, of my team as well. Um, and so I, I don't wanna take away from, from that and I wanna separate the conversation from, from that piece to just hate crimes. I'm sorry, I, I said that just hate crimes. No, that's so reductive to hate crimes. And one of the things that I that I recognized in that um, report from our police department was that when we take a look at um, the last five years from 2017 to two, uh, from 2021, um, the number one group is Black or African American. That's the number one group. Even though they're this, you know, in, in terms of population, very, very small. The next group is Latino. And then we have Asian. Uh, then we have other uh, nationalities. Uh, lastly, Arab and um, no, white and then Arab. Um, and so while I think that we need to make sure that, that um, our all of our community is protected. We have to also take a look at the trends um, before, you know, before this former president, you know, pointed a finger at certain groups to, to highlight them and to scapegoat people and uh, just create chaos amongst ourselves. There's also a trend that has been happening um, just, you know, even before him. So I think while I, um, we do some of the things like um, translate into different languages, um, that we also take a look at who has been historically um, part of those hate crimes and continue to or require that we have a group that also responds to that. Um, is there an opportunity for us to build that partnership with any of the groups that we have out there? To build a partnership with the groups to do some of the work that we're doing on the combating anti-Asian hate. That, those were the original, that was the original recommendation from the city council is to um, right. implement the 16 plus strategies on this. And so, um, you know, I think that requires further further conversation council member um, to see, you know, where does this work live, right? A hate crimes is a, is a, could involve a lot of people, but who's ultimately responsible for tracking this? And, um, yeah, I, and I'm not saying let's, 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 let's have your office be responsible for that. There's also a task force on the county side in that right. we find our role within that task force. And I think that's absolutely okay with that. I uh, I just think that, that there is, there's been things that have been happening in the streets of San Jose and across our nation um, that we also have to recognize and respond to in some way. And I don't know that we ever really had a response in terms of the racial tensions between certain groups, black and brown groups and our police department. And, and I really appreciate what council member Sparza said earlier um, that, the, that uh, we need to integrate uh, these racial equities into um, and principles into everybody's uh, duty manual um, and the way that they um, are trained. Um, but we also have to respond to what we have seen our city um, experience, right? And what we experience, I've never seen that before. I've never seen um, people in the streets being that um, angry and with right, with a, you know, rightly so, they should be angry. Um, and I think we're, we're missing an opportunity as well to recognize that and recognize that in the youth, a lot of youth, I'm not saying everybody who was out there was young, um, but, but change happens with our newer generations and there's an opportunity for us to do that. We may not be the ones doing this, this, this um, you know, holding of that, but we need to align with the folks who are, who are, who are doing some of that and and uh, and figuring out where what our role is within that. Okay, so those that's my feedback 
uh, for this item. Thank you for, for the report. It was absolutely thorough. Um, I know that there's a lot of really good um, work that has been happening um, that is not just reflected in this work plan, but in the next two um, items. Um, and But this is what bubbles to the top, right? This is the actual status report. But now we're going to take a look a little bit, break it down and see some of that work that, get, that you've all been doing, um, which I, I truly appreciate. Um, it is it, it is not easy work to do. Not easy work to do. Um, so hats off to you. Um, I'm oh council member Sparza, I'm sorry. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you. Thank you. Yeah, I just had um, a few uh, a couple of things. So one is um, did you make an amendment to have that promotora item be included when this comes to council? I just wanted to make sure. Is that an amendment? Because I'm willing to accept that. Sure, I, I think uh, okay. to explore the alignment of that promotora uh, framework um, okay. would be wonderful to do. Okay, I'm willing to accept that. And I think uh, Councilmember Jimenez was the seconder. Is he a yeah, I'm good, I'm good with that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I uh, had a, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts. And so one is uh, um, on the idea of the community meeting there's a lot that we do through partners um and so uh we could be the i don't know uh the convener or the uh you know the main sort of convener but we can have other partners uh organize these community uh meetings and i think there's a tremendous value in doing that uh for the caller who called in who had didn't know the history um of san jose i would highly recommend reading the devil in silicon valley by dr stephen Beatty. i think it's referred to in the um, memo for this meeting or for this item and uh it's been included in study sessions that uh the council has had on equity um, and, but I also wanted to highlight, uh, I, I hear council member Arenas's comments about, you know, reconciliation and all, all of that, which is so important, but I wanted to highlight what I think is an operational need, um, for some of these, uh, some of this history to be, uh, shared and, and, and I'll, I'll give you one example, and I'm going um, to mention him because he calls into our meetings when he says, I'm Paul from the Horseshoe. Um, it, it's very hard for uh, communities that have been here, particularly when neighborhoods of color get whitewashed into being called North Willow Glen or West Willow Glen when we know them as the Horseshoe and as Gardner, right? And so uh, that's one example. And so if if you just moved here, for example, you wouldn't know that, right? You wouldn't know that there's this history there. Um, and uh, you wouldn't know some of the, the history and why and how the city is designed the way it is. Um, that in a city that is 94% uh, single family zoned, that so much of multifamily housing is in East of 101. It's certainly not exclusively East of 101, but so much of it has historically been that, you know, and there's a lot of reasons why infrastructure was not built for East San Jose and infrastructure in East San Jose only really got put in when uh, we went to council elections and we had more diversity on the city council. And then we started seeing uh, sewage, sidewalks, lights, paved streets happen for half of the city. Um, and so a lot of this work is new and a lot of folks don't realize that. Um, and so there's an operational need, I think, in sharing some of these things. Uh, and so I, I think we have a lot on our plate here at the city. Um, and so uh, again, whether it's ORE reaching out to partners uh, who can then actually do that. Um, I, th I do think that there is some value in that and that there's a specifically an operational need for that because uh, I, I think, uh, you know, so many of us, Councilmember Arena has talked about how she grew up in San Jose, right? Councilmember Carrasco talks often uh, and that she used to live in the horseshoe growing up and Councilmember Jimenez shares a lot of his stories uh, growing up. And, and uh, if, if, 
we didn't know that and share that with the public, I think so much of that history would be lost. Um, so one, I think there's an operational need for that. I don't necessarily think we should be organizing every aspect of those things because that's a lot of work, but I do think there's a need for that. Secondly, on the study session uh, for the non-citizens voting, um, I actually wanted to offer um, a, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit about this at council having, obviously we need the county registrar voters to be a part of that. The city doesn't run voting. Um, and so the county also has a, um, an immigrant relations and equity offices themselves um, that work with, already work with ROV. And um, so I, I just wanted to throw that out that, that there might be some value um, because there's so much that we are not responsible for on this um, that we bring in the county um, and their uh, respective departments for that. Um, and the third thing, I just wanted to acknowledge sort of my oversight and not updating uh, my colleagues on the county hate crimes task force work. Um, we, uh, it was a, uh, we, as my colleagues know, because they helped propose it, um, in 2019, but it was put on hold because of COVID. And so we're one year in and we have another year left to this time limited task force. Um, and it has been very large. I think we have, um, I wanna guess, I think around 60 members, we have voting members because we're a Brown acted body, but we have an advisory body and we've taken votes of everyone, whether they're technically a voting member or not, because we want consensus in this process. Um, and so uh, there, San Jose State was contracted to develop a report um, and to do listening sessions and of the members. And so people signed up for subcommittees and things like that. I'm happy to share that report when it um, is completed. Um, and uh, I, uh, part of creating this task force was for us to then go back to our respective cities, our respective school districts, um, a county departments, uh, nonprofit organizations, and enact uh, the recommendations of this countywide task force. Um, and so, you know, there, our work certainly will not be done. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll have a lot more and hopefully positive things coming out of that. I did want to just share one of the things that we've learned, which is, um, you're right, Councilmember Arenas, <clears throat> African Americans, and it's true for us um, locally, but it's true nationally, are the number one. Um, number one for hate crimes, number two are our Jewish American and our neighbors. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, that's something that gets overlooked a lot. Um, and given the size of the populations that, um, <clears throat> that there's a lot of ugly stuff that happens, even in our own backyard, we like to think we're above that. Um, unfortunately, sadly, we're not. But one of the other things that has emerged is that we really don't know what we don't know. Um, you know, for some of us, like we've experienced things in, in our lives and we just never reported it to anybody, um, right? I, that's happened to me. I know that's happened to my colleagues and the people in this meeting um, and we don't report it. And so when we talk about statistics and numbers, I think it's mind, we need to be mindful of the fact that there's so much happening out in the community that we don't know. Um, and that's one of the things that has consistently come up in the hate crimes task force is we need, we need different reporting mechanisms. We need people to not have to report things to the government or a law enforcement body, which is a pretty extreme act to take for a lot of folks. Um, and, uh, and to really not force people to kind of say, was this a hate crime or a hate incident? I mean, those are legal nuances that I mean, come on, like, I'm not going to put my mom through that, right? Like, a lot of people aren't going to do that. And so we lose out on really having an understanding of what is happening out in the community. So when, you know, little ladies are afraid to, uh, to come and shop at Little Saigon, that's the result that we're living with.
right? And so regardless, we need to uh, find ways to, to figure that out and then respond to it. And we are. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that I've been remiss um, in sharing that. And um, we will definitely do more as part and share more as part of this task force. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And I, I'll add that it's so much easier to edit a document than to be the, uh, the originator. Uh, so I completely ag agree. And so in, in this process, we're editing. And, um, and I understand that there's a lot of work that went um, and invested a lot of uh, investment in many of the, the items that you were all presenting. And so um, it, it isn't it isn't easy to, to edit, um, but it is so much easier uh, to edit than, than to originate your own document. So I, I absolutely will keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so let's have a roll call for the vote, please. Menace? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Okay, back to the committee. Wonderful. So we're going to move on to item number two, and this is the discussion of the proposed equity roundtable. Um, Zulma. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, let's have Chantel, if you could put up, we have some brief slides. It's a brief memo, but there's some brief slides just to provide a little bit of context. So Chantel, if you can share that screen. And while you're doing that, I think I'll take this opportunity to do a quick shout out about the National Day of Racial Healing is next Tuesday, January 18th. And if you'd like to register for a live event, you can go to healourcommunities.org. Um, and there, you know, this is a great representation about how some of this is done. So I invite you to go to healourcommunities.org for the National Day of Racial Healing next Tuesday. Okay, um, on to the next item. This is a discussion. This is not an item for, and this is not an action item or an acceptance that the NSE committee has to pursue. This is more of a discussion um, of what we're proposing is an equity roundtable. And so with me today, I am um, honored to be joined by two members of the co-design group who volunteered um, for several meetings and hours to co-design and co-create along with other members of the group, um, a proposed equity roundtable, an equity roundtable that, that would be different, but it would inform the work of racial equity in the city of San Jose. And so I'd like to um, introduce you to Hector Sanchez, a longtime resident of San Jose, and he's with the National Compadres Networks, Hector Sanchez Flores. You'll also hear from Carmen Brammer, who's also a longtime resident of San Jose and is with the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet. So on the next slide, I'm gonna provide just a little bit of, of background. Um, you know, we're here today to provide uh, just some initial information that we gathered from the Equity Roundtable co-designers. Uh, we look forward to hearing today's discussion because this discussion amongst the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee um, will help inform the way that we move forward and will help inform future meetings with this group. Um, so we're not, bringing to get, we're not bringing forward today a detailed process, but rather a general proposed scope of work, uh, the types of representation and selection process for a committee for you all to consider. So it's just a starting point, but I think a really good starting point for, um, for discussion. Uh, so just to put this into context, why, we even, why we're even here, uh, there is a direction from Councilmember Arenas a year, uh, just oh, yeah, in January of 2021, to examine and align the scope of work of what we had the Human Services Commission with the work of the newly formed Office of Racial Equity. Uh, we were staffing the Human Services Commission. There are numerous challenges there in trying to get quorum or trying to get people to even apply to be a part of the commission. And there's several reasons for that. It was just very broad scope. Um, so based on that direction, the Office of Racial Equity researched several advisor groups and other cities and jurisdictions that were connected to equity type offices. And what we found was that many of these cities and their advisory bodies had strong language on addressing racial equity and a de detailed and clear relationship between the advisory bodies and the city council administration and the community at large. Uh, so last summer we met with uh, council member 
for Chair Arenas and proposed an alternative advisory body, one that would be distinct and different from a commission, that would be representative of the diversity of the community and functioned in a way that would provide meaningful input to the city while affording some flexibility. So uh, we then proceeded to organize discussions in, um, with, with the co-design group. We had three meetings from October to December with some, several diverse community members. And the purpose of those meetings was to inform and co-design a framework, scope, and selection process for what we're tentatively calling a roundtable equity uh, uh, roundtable group. So with that, um, on the next slide, you'll see some of the people that were involved. Um, some were recommended by, um, by council member offices, uh, specifically council member Arenas, and others really just volunteered and said, we would love to be a part of this co-design group. So here you'll see a range of participants um, that represented you know, different ethnicities and races and um, gender identities and age groups and as well as faith communities. So I wanna thank um, all those groups that have participated in the last few months on um, what has been you know, difficult work to try to reimagine something different, the kind of group that really will have a meaningful impact in the way that we do business in the city organization. Um, and so with that, we're going, I'm gonna hand it off over to Hector, which is who's going to illustrate some of the themes that surfaced in those meetings. So actually, Soma, I'll be doing that. Yeah. Carmen. Yes, <laughs> yes, Carmen. It's all, good. it's all good. If you can go to the next slide, please. So as Suna mentioned, we had a very diverse team of uh, community members, and we had some really deep discussions and honest and candid discussions. And through that, we identified some key themes that this equity roundtable should follow in order to ensure that the community believes our city is truly committed to transformational change. First and foremost, there must be an acknowledgement of the government's role in systemic racism, which has harmed and traumatized marginalized communities. And at its core, the roundtable values must be focused on being meaningful, long-lasting, transparent, and ensure accountability. The roundtable values and efforts must also flow through all city departments to be truly effective and embedded in our culture. And we are gonna make sure that the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined for everyone. Plus, we also want to ensure that the focus is on policy areas which defi with defined outcomes that addresses racism and improves the lives of our harmed communities. At the end of the day, all this will serve to amplify and affirm our city's dedication to walking the talk to bring about the change we know is required to ensure every voice is valued and represented. And we can go to the next Thank slide. Thank you, Carmen. Um, first of all, it's a privilege to be here today. Happy New Year, everybody. I want to share that when we go, when when this group of individuals, really deep thinking individuals of the community of you know Carmen has contributed quite a bit, but the names would go on for quite some time of the people that were really invested in this process. What we discovered was is that uh, we want, in centering uh, racial equity amongst all commissions and creating a sense of connection and, and, and accountability within it is a very, it's a heavy lift, but it's a, it's a lift we wanna take. And so we recognize that this is very challenging. We want to support the process of creating clearly defined uh, efforts with expected with expectations and guidelines associated with that so that everybody has a buy-in and a responsibility to carry it through we we recognize that although there may be an advisory group that that this the, the theme of racial equity and its impact and residence throughout the city uh, is the responsibility of all commissions and all commissioners and so in addition to sometimes doing the work that is very focused also making sure that we're supporting the other commissions who should be looking at the impact that they have on, on the residents of San Jose. Uh, we wanna be uh, thinking about recommendations. We wanna be thinking about what, we, what our informed lens can do to enhance this process. And I'll give one tangible example from this conversation today. We have heard the term reconciliation. 
and people that have that I have uh, learned from deeply have shown and taught me why in the United States we don't use the term reconciliations as they have in other countries when they've dealt with strife. And they point to us that uh, these people that have written about it and thought about it, they say, in this country, we don't have a point of reconciliation too. That the country's founding on um, a failed genocide and taking of land from native people, the, the, the enslavement and brought uh, bringing of people from Africa in, and enslaved here, the um, settler colonialism that expanded. The people from South Africa were the ones that told the US representatives like, well, what are you reconciling to? So these are the things that I had never thought about, right? That the people that are paid to think about this had informed me. So those are the things that I think we can bring to this to really make it go deep and expansive. And then ultimately, much like today, really work with and advise the city's leadership and department heads to reflect and look at policies, programs, and services and strategies that sees our community, that allows our community to feel seen and create a symbiotic learning process and leadership process so that we're all moving in the same direction together. Carmen, next slide. Thanks. And I, Hector reminded me, I forgot to say Happy New Year to everybody <laughs> and glad to be here too. Uh, so as uh, Hector also mentioned, we did have some really deep, lengthy discussions and Suma was very patient with us. Our discussions about how, what the, this whole process, including membership and what our recommendations are is a stipend for individuals serving on the round table and members are to be selected by committee by a committee made up of community members, city administration, and departments. We want to make sure that all voices are heard. We want individuals from immigrant communities, diverse ethnic ethnicity and backgrounds, with priority given to those from underserved, underrepresented, marginalized communities. In addition, we want to make sure that we have inclusiveness of age, abilities, gender, gender identity and sexual preferences. And this tags on to what uh, Hector just said about making sure that all voices are heard and all voices are represented. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Carmen and Hector, for taking the afternoon away from all the other stuff that you're doing to join us and, and be able to summarize what you heard within the group. Um, and so, uh, for, for the council members, the, the memo delineates um, just a little more detail on this area. And so what we need today is to hear your reflections about what you've heard so that then we can take that information, um, go back, uh, Hector, Carmen, the team and I will go back with the co-design group, take your direction and, and you know, put, place it over you know, what, what's been discussed so that then we can come back um, and offer you know, what the proposed equity roundtable, what it would do, um, how it will function, and um, how we move forward on, on selecting people for the roundtable. So before we, we got any further, we wanted to do basically a check-in with you. And so there are some questions that you'll find here um, about the proposed scope. So what works? What resonates with you? What did you like? Um, where do you need clarity? Is there something missing? We could have a blind spot. Um, you know, let us know. And then the second piece of this about the proposed uh, membership criteria, criteria, just thoughts on the selection process and committee representation. Um, this would then again, help us form and um, inform our agenda setting for the next meeting. Great, thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna go to public comment before we move to my colleagues. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Boy, Hector taking us to church. What? <laughs> hey, the reconciliation. Now, I've spent over 38 years of my life inside of institutions, juvenile halls, jails, prisons. I've been to 10 different prisons. I've spent five years in solitary confinement. And this is what I learned about that word reconciliation, is that it's last. It's last. It's a four point system. First, you must reckon with the truth. You absolutely must reckon with it. Not me, I've already reckoned with it. 
it has to come from the Gavachos. They must reckon with the truth. That's number one. Number two is rectify. Now, what system or process do we use and incorporate in order to rectify that which we have reckoned with? Number three is the reparation. Now that we've reckoned and now that we've rectified, now we need to reparate. And that is means resources. And that means direct resources to the people that were tracked. You see, our audios were tracked to uh, vocational schools. That means that they already knew systematically that they were going to deprive the future generations because Jill Borders hit that the other day. Jill Borders said, if, if I don't have a college education, it's more likely my children aren't going to have a college education. If I am not able to own a home via redlining policies, then I, we're not going to be able to pass down that well to the kids and you know so on and so forth. So it's really easy, but the reparation, it must happen. Number four, reconciliation. That's the process of a restorative justice system. And that's what is a part of my rehabilitation, is that that engaging in that process, admitting the truth, correcting the truth, uh, 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 reparating if there's anything that I owe, anything that I owe. That's why I do what I do right now for free. I, three years, I spent all this time with you guys because I'm so grateful for the opportunity to participate in my life. I'm a freaking... Claire Beekman? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, thanks for this item a lot. Uh, thanks for the words of Paul. Uh, he offered a good list of, uh, uh, for this for this group. My own list, uh, it's a little bit more specific, and I don't know if if you can you would want to be working in these specifics at this time. To offer specifics, maybe can help the process along and and offer a bit of clarity for people what they can expect. It's my, been my understanding that uh, this this uh, the equity roundtable can work towards ideas of uh, the future of the commission process and how it can be have a more uh, accessible voice, a more direct voice to city government itself uh, with, its, with the decisions made within the commission process and how it can learn to become a more of a, a community process basically and, involve, and invite and involve more people of the community uh, to the commission process and to make decisions directly with government itself. And, uh, that's a lot that we've been trying to work on for a long time in San Jose. I hope the equity roundtable can be up to this sort of work and can want to do this sort of work under the ideas of equity. Maybe this is a way to bring in that sort of good direction. Um, and also, if you noticed in my speech yesterday, I spoke yesterday at Rules and Open Government. If you noticed at the Tuesday uh, meeting, you know, on the charter issues that we're talking about the future of a uh, you know, uh, uh, voting rights for people who have uh, working visas in this country. Um, there was an issue that we couldn't have uh, Zoom interpretation, language interpretation at the beginning of the meeting. Why is that? I think we really have to have a discussion about uh, English only uh, language issues that were developed in the 1980s. We have a problem with that. We have to work on that. Thank you. No borders. Hi, thank you. I feel really, really inspired and grateful for this meeting. Um, I have signed up. Thank you so much for the um, National Day of uh, Ra Racial Healing. I've signed up and RSVP'd. I'll make sure to attend that. Um, I am extremely excited to think of the possibility of somehow all of these ideas coming to you that, that San Jose could actually um, have these meetings where this healing can start to begin. I, I just, I feel compelled to say, um, you know, one of the things that's on my heart every single day is this idea, and I've mentioned it before in other meetings, that we have renters and we have homeowners, and we're becoming more and more divided all of the time. And I am, I, my reconciliation, one of the things I have to reconcile is this idea that I was raised, I was born to homeowners. I'm now a mobile homeowner. I struggled and struggled and struggled to be able to pay rent and was evicted and had all kinds of issues. And, and so my heart is always with people that don't, they're not the only ones that have the key to their door. Their landlord has a key to their door. 
And so I know that when you talk about multifamily housing on the other side, on east side, I'm over by Oak Ridge Mall, South San Jose, it hurts my heart to know that when you're born a renter, that you most likely will then be a renter. So that wealth, that wealth accumulation is not happening. And I'm done with that. I am so done with that. Every single person that is here in San Jose should have an, a right to ownership and not just the, this home ownership, but, but the, the, the idea that they belong in the community and that their wealth is more than that dollar amount, which we all need, but it's, it's investment in their community. So I, we need to work hard on this. Back to the committee. Thank you. I don't see any hands. Um, so I'm, I'm going to begin with my comments. Um, thank you to our, our community that is uh, providing some wonderful feedback today during public comment. Okay. And uh, to you, Carmen and Hector and everybody else who sat around the table with you um, having this, this discussion, I really appreciate the time that you've spent um, being thoughtful about this design, um, how everybody's role, um, what that would look like. Um, I, I'm supportive of, of uh, the direction that you're going in. Um, and I think I, I shared this with you, uh, Sulma, and I would love to see this because we, we always say, where are the young people, right? <laughs> we like to hear from the young people, um, but we also have to accommodate uh, for them. And so I wonder if maybe there is um, an opportunity, um, and, and I mean, the, 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 the youth that is not on track, not necessarily on track for college, um, you know, that this is not part of something that is going to, you know, they're going to just add to their resume of things that they've accomplished, but um, somebody can, a couple of folks from with different type of perspectives. Um, as well as the, the faith communities, because as you know, um, South Asians um, can bring a, a different uh, perspective um, as they are always confused for Muslims um, and get, you know, a, a focus on them that, um, anyways, uh, and I think that, that they come from a country that all, has also dealt with inequities. Um, and I really would value to have our South Asian um, community be part of that conversation. But in general, the faith-based community, of course, Jewish, the Jewish community, I won't even go down that road. We all know how the suffering from those from that community. Um, that That's my feedback. Do you want to, um, Suma, do you want to share your screen so that... Um, yeah, I was just going to ask Chantel if she could please pull up that last slide again that has just a set of questions to facilitate a conversation. Yeah, and don't really the, the questions to from that because we will answer questions. <laughs> um, but I appreciate that. Um, I, I really love that you had, um, I think you had somebody from a youth representative already utilizing power and praise youth you utilize in power and praise which was i thought was really wonderful um and i think that there's there's um folks that that uh from the east side union high school district they have a oh my gosh what do you call it it's like a youth um representative um that comes to their attends their month on the monthly basis attends their board meetings and votes it's a preferential vote, it's not a, a formal vote, but nonetheless, they, they add their vote there, um, which I think is, is um, uh, honors uh, their participation. I really like that you thought about them having um, a stipend. Um, this is gonna be a lot of work because th this is the beginning of a, a brand new commission-ish um, group. Um, uh, I'm not crazy about the title, but I know that that's not even, you know, I know, I'm seeing Carmen, I know that's not even the title of it, but but uh, I look forward to seeing what the possibilities are for that, that title. Um, anyways, I'm excited. I'm excited about how this uh, could happen and, and to see maybe how we could leverage 
uh, the objectives of other departments to bring in community so that it's not exclusive, just, um, uh, you know, it meets the, the provide support and feedback to, to many different departments. I think this could be a really great soundboard for folks. Um, anyways, that's my feedback. Uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I think, uh, I think, you know, it's great. Uh, we need to hear from residents. Um, and I'm reminded of some of the work we did during SNI. Um, and so, uh, Angel, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you a little bit to see if you remember some of the work that we did in terms of bringing in, uh, groups from all over the city um, together and um, and then breaking them up. Uh, and, uh, and so I think uh, one of the things that I would be really interested in seeing, and, and this is something that I've brought up sort of consistently on some of the work uh, in different commissions and committees and work groups that have been proposed before us is, um, you know, in the past, we have consistently gone to the same group of people, we've gone to the same folks, and we same individuals, and we also go to the same nonprofits. Um, and some of them may or may not even live in San Jose, to be honest, right. And they do work in different parts of San Jose. And so one of the things I'm interested in is really ensuring that we're engaging residents from throughout the city. And, um, and the reason I started off with that SNI is, um, I think there's value to bringing folks um, physically together and inviting people from some parts of the city to come to other parts of the city and see what that's like. One of the, one of the, things that so many people who grew up in East San Jose have in common is the first time they left sort of East San Jose and went to another part of the city. And maybe this is more for older people as well too, um, is, you know, because back then a part, I mean, I, I'm going to just say, I, I know council member Campos, council member Chavez, council member Shirakawa, council member Diaz, who am I forgetting, uh, Mayor Gonzalez, like so many folks um, were still fighting in the, in the 2000s for sidewalks and streetlights, right? Um, and so when, so when folks left the east side and went to another part of the city, it kind of blows people's minds to see how different being in the same city can be. And, um, and I think we need a little bit more of that in some of this work. And so again, in terms of membership, whether that's uh, the membership, ensuring that we have folks from different parts of the city, um, geographic locations of the city and time for people to come together and break bread. And um, you know, there's a tremendous value to just sitting down at a table and talking to each other's people <laughs> um, and say, you know, hey, what, what I, here's what I'm, I'm upset about. What are you upset about, right? Because that's all too often how people start engaging with the city, right? And, and, and it's interesting for me representing District 7 when I go and I talk to folks who live in Almaden Valley, like they're upset, you know, crime is through the roof in Almaden Valley, right? And then, um, you know, I sit down and I say, okay, well, you know, what are some of your concerns, right? And and they share with me, you know, things that they are upset about and should be upset about, right? And then I share with them, like some of the things that are happening in District 7, right? And it's just, it's a tale of two cities. And I think some of those like person to person engagements need to take place and, and bringing folks from different parts of the city and bringing them together and sharing those realities and inviting people um, to these other parts of the city so that the meetings can be held in different parts of the city. Um, I, I know a lot of folks that never leave Willow Glen. You can do all, do all your shopping. You can do, you know, there's a library there, a great library. Um, you know, the grocery shopping, church, like school, <laughs> everything, right? Um, and so imagine if you've never left that bubble 
um, you go to, you know, Santee or Colmar and, um, and really see a, um, a round table, right? Cadillac Winchester to see some of the other realities in this city and go, oh, okay, wait a minute. Like, and, and, and I bring that up because there's a lot of value to sitting down and talking um, and talking about equity, but I'm gonna keep pushing on this. At the end of the day, five of us brought this forward in 2019 because we live in very different cities and we need to start changing that. Um, and we need to do that in real tangible ways. And I think um, a lot of these conversations, um, you know, I, I can't change 1492. I think that there's a lot of um, uh, value in sitting down and talking about it. I, I love the fact, you know, when we're out at events um, and, and people acknowledge that we are standing in stolen land, right? I mean, I didn't grow up that way. And I love that that's becoming um, uh, uh, acknowledged. Um, and uh, I think it's important to do that. And, and there's a lot of, even my own family's history, I used to argue with uh, teachers growing up because I had people uh, telling me internment camps never happened, <laughs> you know? Uh, I, so, and that was my own family, you know? And it's like, give me a break, right? So, so those are important histories to be shared, but at the end of the day, the city has a responsibility and a duty to provide services and infrastructure in an equitable way to all the residents in the city. And so that's why I think um, we need to bring people together uh, from different parts of the city, do that in an intentional way and bring folks uh, to have maybe some of these meetings physically be in other parts of the city, because I think that's gonna be an eye-opening um, process. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, very great feedback. Um, I agree with with uh, having some geographic based um, representation. That's really important. Um, seeing that there aren't any more uh, hands going up, uh, would you mind uh, provide? Oh, this is not does not need approval from. The committee, so we will skip that. Thank you so much for the report. We'll look forward to seeing this and um, and how um, the scope will look for, for the, the folks here and the membership. I, I'm really excited about um, having them grow at the same time we're growing um, and then uh, potentially having them come to our NSC committee as well to see how their feedback um, informs and shapes policy as well. So thank you so much, Carmen and Hector um, and all of your team uh, for, for doing all the work that you've done, um, Andrea and Carla. Um, am I missing anybody? Okay, well, uh, I apologize if I did, but thank you so much for the work. Now we are- Could I say oh, one thing though? Yes, go right oh, right ahead. Mm -hmm. So I do wanna thank Sulma and her team, they were phenomenal. We were not an easy group to work with, I'll let you know that. Um, but they were very open to hearing candid truths and that really helped formulate this presentation. So we're super happy to be working with her. Thank you. So, so I just wanna acknowledge Carmen and the rest of the people. Um, we were we were the, the two people that were identified to share this, but there were many other people that could have carried this to this meeting. And so I don't, I would, hate to think that people walk away thinking it was my specific intellect that got us here. It was really co a collective effort. And I want to acknowledge everybody else too. And thank you both. Graceful. Thank you. Thank you both. And please let the group know that we really appreciate and we look forward to future partnerships. And so thank you. All right, we are going to move on to item D3. And who, who is this again? So it's the chair. I, I'm going to open it up and I'm going to turn it over to, to Carla um, from, from our library. But, you know, just wanted to kind of make a couple of connecting points here. You know, we just heard two presentations. Uh, the Absolutely. first one really focused on kind of the role of the Office of Racial Equity, uh, right, in terms of its role in implementing and monitoring, uh, monitoring a citywide uh, racial equity framework and then building organizational capacity, right? And so that's kind of more the, the organizational um, you know, 
structure that we're trying to create within the organization. Uh, and we know as we do that, it's important to kind of really provide and give departments the space to kind of work through these various issues, you know, in terms of how they apply equity in, in the day-to-day -day work that they're doing. And, and, and a great example of how the Office of Racial Equity is partnering and quickly building uh, these equity practices is, is, is with the library, right? Now, of course, the library kind of jumped on from day one in terms of really embracing this work of equity. And uh, they've been committed from, from day one and they have dedicated staff like Carla Alvarez and, and her, and her uh, racial equity team there in the department. Um, and so I think the presentation you're gonna hear now is kind of a, an example of how this is playing out at the department level. Uh, and highlighting, you know, one of our key departments uh, that, of course, has a high touch um, and, and impacts many, you know, of, of our of our San Jose residents, right, on a day to day basis. So, with that, I'll turn it over to Jill and Carla, and uh, for that for for their report. Thank you, Angel, and uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Arenas and members of the committee. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first annual equity report from the San Jose Public Library. The library has a longstanding stated mission of fostering lifelong learning and ensuring that every member of the community has access to a vast array of information and ideas. So by intention, the library values the diverse communities in San Jose and seeks to support all learners in all stages of life by providing the resources, services, and programs that they need to thrive. In addition to that, the education policy 0-30 uh, that arose from the Education and Digital Literacy Strategy established Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, or EDI by its acronym, as an expectation of inclusive programming that intentionally monitors outcomes and provides and removes barriers to ensure community access. So we all know that equity cannot be taken for granted. And so we made it a focus to examine our practices and we needed expertise and prioritization to do that, as Angel said. So we created a dedicated position for equity and inclusion back in February of 2020. And now the timing seems absolutely miraculous uh, as we closed down in March of 2020. Uh, we were very fortunate to recruit Carla Alvarez as our community programs administrator for equity and inclusion services. Mm -hmm. Carla comes to the city with more than 15 years of experience implementing local, national and international social programs in the nonprofit sector. Since joining the library, Carla has been working not only closely with the Office of Race Equity and key partners citywide and library staff to lead equity working groups and projects, develop tools and serve as a thought partner in incorporating equity into the library service delivery models. So I'm very proud of the work the staff has undertaken to center equity. And so today we are offering this work, which we will continue to evolve in alignment with the city's work and feedback from council as potential models for teams to embed equity in their work in the city. And so with that, I will introduce Car Carla Alvarez and she's gonna share some of these highlights with the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Good afternoon, council members and members of the public joining us today. So next slide, please. Buenas tardes a quienes nos están durmiendo hoy en la tarde, mucho gusto. It is my pleasure to share an overview of the equity work undertaken by the library. As we focus on pandemic recovery efforts, it is impossible to ignore the way in which the pandemic has exacerbated inequities in our city, particularly among communities of color with disabilities access, economic vulnerability and other vulnerabilities faced by our residents. By incorporating an equity lens, the library recognizes the importance of identifying the changed and emerging needs in our communities, rebuilding relationships and creating programs in response to these needs. This includes attending community events outside of our own branches and re-engaging with our community members about services, resources, and programming needs in their trusted spaces. Next slide. <laughs> As part of the education and digital literacy strategy, the library has been developing the framework for developing, assessing, and reporting on program quality. This past spring, we began the development of the equity, diversity, and inclusion quality standards. The process for developing these EDI quality standards began with a group of library staff who researched best practices in equity, diversity, and inclusion, identified at other library systems, government agencies, 
educational institutions, nonprofits, and the private sector. The library then invited subject matter experts to join an ad hoc committee to determine the scope and criteria that would become our quality standards framework. The ad hoc committee met twice this fall in September and October 2021. These standards apply to all city funded, operated, or endorsed programs. Next slide. The ad hoc committee members included a diverse array of dedicated people, and we extend our deepest appreciation to those who contributed their time and provided critical feedback for the development of the quality standards. Next slide. Quality standards provide the foundation for quality assessments and define the outcomes, indicators, and metrics for evaluation. The equity, diversity, and inclusion quality standards recommended by the ad hoc committee comprise six areas, anti-racist approach, inclusive programming, data collection and analysis, culturally relevant pedagogy, community involvement in programming, and outreach as key to inclusion. The ad hoc committee's feedback included the importance of prioritizing resources to historically underserved communities, of intentionally planning for and integrating community feedback into our programming design throughout the program cycle, the importance of plain and accessible language, materials, and imagery, as well as ensuring that holistic and targeted outreach is integrated into program plans to ensure targeted community members learn about and participate in the opportunities available to them. We made the decision to lead with anti-racism and intersectionality, or the interconnected nature of social categories such as race, gender, abilities, disabilities, class, and others, to continually scan for and address policies and practices that inequitably and negatively impact our diverse communities. A key aspect of our discussions included the importance of establishing training and tools to build staff capacity, not only to understand these concepts, but also infuse program implementation with this approach and ultimately ensure that equity, diversity, and inclusion is baked into the way in which teams carry out their work as a whole across all levels and dimensions. As a working document, these standards will be continually reviewed and we will also plan for additional spaces to integrate community feedback. Next slide. One of the tools that the library developed in 2019 and is critical to guide our service delivery model is the equity index. This tool visualizes community areas facing disadvantages in relation to the rest of San Jose. As the library continues to make necessary adaptations in programming and overall service delivery to meet the needs of all, the equity index informs the library's strategy in response to the gaps and variances of community needs, availability of local service providers, and library operations. Pictured in this slide is a snapshot of the data visualization used to better understand access to libraries when identifying potential bridge libraries. This included library branch locations, bridge libraries, one mile walking distance areas to a branch, as well as key population demographics. Next slide. Another equity tool developed this past year to foster learning for the community is a new section on our website sjpl.org backslash equity dash inclusion. The new section on our website includes subsections on anti-racism resources, reading recommendations from library staff, information about library by mail and other resources, as well as programs available. Next slide. The new website section also includes some important definitions as part of normalizing these concepts in community. Having a shared language is vital to advancing equity to ensure we are understanding the same meanings, references, and issues overall. At SJPL, we identify these four equity principles and definitions. The focus on anti-racism is very important and highlights the need for ongoing work to look at our policies and practices. This also correlates to the work carried out by the city's Office of Racial Equity as we've been discussing today, and as part of this effort, one of the new web pages features a resource page on anti-racism materials to deepen individuals' understanding of racism and recommended organizations leading anti-racism efforts. Next slide. At the library, we currently have four staff-led equity working groups. During fiscal year 2020-21, 
The Disabilities Access Committee undertook four main projects, including developing content for the accessibility page on our website and launching the library by mail service. The committee would launch an, an accessibility user survey to better understand the needs of, this, uh, of the community and identifying opportunities for the library to support. Staff on the Insiders Committee are planning two key upcoming projects, a resource fair in March 2022 and Disabilities Awareness Day in October 2022. The library's racial equity team works to deepen conversations and increase racial equity in library service delivery. This past year, the RET, as we often refer to it by its acronym, undertook a series of projects, including developing safety training and protocol recommendations, as well as leading several learning sessions for library staff. A total of five affinity groups facilitated by RET members were piloted in July, 2021 for staff who identify as Asian, Latinx, Hispanic, Indigenous, Native, Mixed Race, or Black, as well as a white learning ally group. The groups are open to staff of all classifications and their participation is included as part of their work time. Lastly, the LGBT plus community was uh, formed in September, 2021 to amplify LGBTQ plus voices and experiences throughout the year. The committee will meet quarterly to plan around, plan programming around key dates such as Pride and National Coming Out Day. Next slide. Since 2018, the library has been hosting community conversations each quarter to gather community feedback, concerns, and uh, gather programming suggestions. Beginning late 2020, library staff facilitated conversations around key issues in the community, including the digital divide, the COVID vaccine, and racial inequity with guest presenters. By bringing in guest speakers, this also provides an opportunity for residents to come together and speak about the discrimination and impact faced by some in our communities, as well as highlight some of the local efforts underway to transform and support different needs. As part of our equity approach, the library also includes separate sessions for Spanish only and Vietnamese only speakers each quarter. Community conversations are also a volunteer where your finds opportunity, providing patrons with the opportunity to have up to $20 applied to waive overdue fines for their participation in these spaces. Next slide. As we look ahead for this year, we will continue refining the EDI quality standards, as well as developing a resource list of recommended tools and trainings. Each equity staff working group is in the process of working on their identified priority projects. And as the new tiered programming approach is introduced with corresponding data collection, we will move deeper into program impact analyses and planning with our equity index. We look forward to continuing to work with the city's Office of Racial Equity and colleagues across the city departments to advance on this work. Next. Thank you for your time and we look forward to your feedback. Thank you, Carla. Um, I'm gonna go uh, to our public comment. Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, Sonoda Alvarez, for your presentation. Um, I hope you didn't get too offended by the email that I sent to the library, uh, like recently, um, because I was just like, "Oh my God, this, 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 it, it, it's not pointed enough." It, it, it's like, let's have equity for all. That's an oxymoron. Most people don't know that though. Equity for everybody is an oxymoron. And until you are able to articulate the nuance and understand and comprehend it and give concrete examples, then it, it, you know people don't really understand. They just want to do the right thing. I get it. I love it. But that it, there, there, there still needs to be some tweaking on it. And I would I, and, and, and that tweaking, I think, is going to be facilitated by there's within, I think, February, March, there is going to be a couple of presentations there at that library. And it's entitled The Untold Stories of the East Side. Okay. They're accumulating documents about what happened over there in Saucy Puedes. Now, you can't get no more Saucy Puedes than myself. My I have pictures of my father going up in a tent on the grounds of what is now Guadalupe Church. I have all kinds of pictures of him with the dirt roads. You can see the lack of the infrastructure. My dad's just kicking back there in the dirt. He's four and employed. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, this is this, and, and so I'm very, very like excited about that particular project that you guys got going. Um, uh, I had a little, you know, back and forth with Shane, but you know, that's uh, but the the work that you're doing is very, it's critically important because the libraries are where we get our education, and education was a problem in the 60s. That's why we had Sophie Mendoza, Las Mujeres de Aslan, y Confederación de la Raza Unida. Those two groups busted down the doors of Roosevelt Junior High School, got all the kids out, and had 38 teachers fired in one swap. Joe Borders. Hi, this is, I'm hoping it's slightly on topic, but I, the value of the libraries is so important and the work that you're doing right now, this makes me so happy. Um, one thing that I'm really hopeful for is having a conversation about how, and if possible, I don't know where the money comes from or how to do this, but um, it, SB 330 is where now uh, affordable housing can just be streamlined through. So any affordable houser that finds a space that can you know, build it, it just it can get built. So there's an affordable housing complex that's gonna be built along Blossom Hill Road and they don't have to put in any commercial on the bottom and that's fine. But they're losing that opportunity to have that be a community space on the bottom for not only all the people that live there in that affordable housing space, but for you know the entire community. And so I keep pushing for a micro library and I don't know how to do it. So I'm dropping it in here in this comment because I know there are librarians here and there are council members here and other very knowledgeable people. Um, and so if we could remember that Oh, if we if fine, we lose a commercial space, you know, unfortunately, that's all of that fiscal stuff that, you know, the mayor and everybody want to worry about all the time. I know it's important. But when we lose a community space, it's it's so disheartening. So I want to encourage any SB 330 streamlined affordable housing to go in. That's fabulous. We need a lot of it. I wish they were more all community owned owned and all the people in, that live there would be part owners, that would be the ultimate goal. But in the absence of that, let's make sure that the people that live there can just go downstairs and grab a newspaper and read it for free or grab a book or see this micro museum that you're gonna put in these libraries. Um, this should be everywhere. So I'm hopeful that we can make this happen. Thank you. Michelle Rowick. Hi, um, my name's Michelle Rowick and I'm a librarian with the San Jose Public Library and a member of the EDI Quality Standards Committee with Carla. Thank you, Carla, for the presentation. Uh, looking back, I see my participation on the committee as a culmination of my 14 years working at the library, putting into writing and formalizing the library's commitment to and striving for equity and inclusion. Since I began working at San Jose Public Library, we have always sought to reduce barriers and be welcoming and inclusive to all community members. So in 2007, that looked like getting rid of, rid of registration for and not limiting attendance limits to our story times, letting people arrive late to, to our programs, expanding funding and resources for family learning centers, English language learner conversations clubs, and citizenship classes. Uh, we began hosting summer food programs and inclusive story times. Every one of our locations has a teen advisory group we call Teens Reach and a designated space for teens in our buildings. We went fines free for children and hopefully looking ahead will be fines free for all ages. In my experience, San Jose Public Library is always at the forefront of equity and inclusion in libraries. The library is watching listening, adapting, and transforming in accord with the changing needs and times. The EDI quality standards are goals and ideals put into writing for staff to see what we have done, what we are doing, and what we are striving to achieve in every interaction. I believe the standards are applicable across all City of San Jose departments and will enable city employees to track, measure, and reflect on our progress in achieving equity and inclusion. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Hopefully I can uh, be a bit idealistic on this item. Uh, thank you that you've described uh, equity and inclusion uh, issues for this item. Digital inclusion is incredibly important to ourselves 
and um, its timing was a little strange that we've been working on it hard uh, for a number of years now. And with the arrival of COVID-19, uh, it just blew open the doors to put on a whole bunch of 4G and 5G in our local neighborhoods. Um, this was an uncomfortable process and it is an uncomfortable process, I think, for ourselves. I'm very interested how we can work towards the ideas of open public policy practices and its accountability, how the notification process uh, of new uh, cell towers being put up, uh, the, the whole openness and accountability process to go along with the digital equity issues, I think is a very important combination for our future. It really defines our, our future of sustainable practices as a community. It's not just dumping in a bunch of technology and saying we're here now, it's doing it in, in intelligent terms, in terms of sustainability for a community. Uh, it's our better practices and our better selves. We're dealing with a bunch of new law enforcement questions. This 4 and 5G has a ton of new surveillance technology involved with it that with open public policies, we can have a, a, a course and a direction and a voice. Everyday community who are gonna be sitting on their computers now can have a voice in, in what, and to help shape what the future of, of this technology will be about for ourselves. So um, I hope you can keep this in mind and um, this is our better selves at this time and can obviously help with our questions at this time. So good luck to open public policy ideas for ourselves and accountability. Thank you. Jennifer Lucas. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lucas with the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities uh, Central Coast Office. The State Council is established in um, both federal and state law. And we work to ensure that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are fully included as members of their community and are able to access the services and supports they need. We accomplish this through advocacy, capacity building and systems change. And there's a state council in each state. Um, California is unique in that we also happen to have 12 regional offices throughout the state. Um, and I'm with one of those offices, which covers uh, Santa Clara County. Um, and I'm here today because I wanted to um, share my support of the library's equity inclusion service report. And I also wanted to express um, the council's appreciation for their engagement with a variety of stakeholders, um, gathering our feedback through both committee meetings and also one-on-one -on -one meetings, which are time intensive and keeping us informed of uh, the ongoing progress. We look forward to continued collaboration with the San Jose Public Library, including with their Insiders Program. And um, we're also happy to support other city departments around inclusive practices. Thank you. Back to the committee. Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't see anybody, not anybody's hand, so I'm gonna step in with some comments. Thank you for a great presentation and um, obviously a lot of work behind it. Um, one of the questions that I had was, um, I, as I was reading the report, I think it was Commissioner Sizer who had said that they he wanted like a subcommittee, a standing subcommittee. I know that's something that's not necessarily a recommendation, but I wonder how can we um, address that need? I don't I, I think he wasn't alone in, in that. Um, and I wonder if, if, if there's something that we could um, maybe approach some of these commissioners to be part of the equity roundtable. Um, could be another possibility there. Um, I, I think it, when people are excited to talk about race and equity, we should find a path for them, right? Um, it, is there anything else that you might have already thought of uh, for commissioners who would be more who would continue who would want to continue their participation? Yes, uh, Councilmember, thank you. We are uh, we were starting to work on developing what our typical process is an ad hoc committee of the commission, and so that will be in process soon. And then, uh, but I, I liked your idea of offering our commissioners their opportunities. So as the city um, evolves some of these other uh, bodies or 
for review processes, we will definitely um, put them forward to our commissioners as appropriate. But at our upcoming meeting, um, you'll hear a little bit more about the establishment of an ad hoc. Okay, good, good. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Um, and 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 I guess I'm wondering how how does that um, because I think another question of his was um, what is that level of support that OE, ORE can provide uh, the department? I know we we. We kind of explore this in uh, first item. Um, is that something that that was um, on everyone's mind, and, and Commissioner Sizer just uh, verbalized it, or is this something that you've all you've all uh, worked out? Um, I would. I Carla might have more comment on this, but I I mean the way that we've approached it so far, knowing that the Office of Race Equity has been kind of. Uh, initiating so much work during this time is that Carla's just worked incredibly closely with them and been a support to them, but also um, ensured that the work we did is in alignment with them. But Carla, I don't know if there's more you want to add to that. Yes, I, I, I com the commissioner's uh, questions were really more um, curious about how, how we work with the Office of Racial Equity, and that's a question I often get from several of our community partners. And so as Jill um, states, I do have, um, we actually have an equity meeting space with, um, with a member of the, of the RE staff every month and uh, the other department housing that has another full-time equity position. And then there's a variety of meetings and exchanges that occur throughout, throughout the year as um, in, in even the preparation for this meeting and making sure that we're sharing and updating um, on what we're planning and, and knowing full well that they're there precisely to be thought partners to provide technical support. And we're actually very much looking forward to the trainings that are being developed with the consultants right now so that we can then integrate that into our onboarding and our um, opportunities for continued learning among the library staff and volunteers. Great, well, th thank you for that. Um, I know that you all must be walking hand in hand with the, in, in this process. This is, um, an, this is kind of a new path for all of us, even though I heard, and I can't remember uh, the librarian that called in and I apologize about that, um, but I thought it was just really interesting the way um, her reflection about uh, how, how this process is really just formalizing a lot of the input that she's had throughout her career to make things more accessible, and more convenient for, for our um, families and, and giving it a name and a path, right, that really is deserving um, and recognizing uh, of those needs. And so I, I really love that, that the librarian called in, uh, the librarian. <laughs> We don't get so we don't get many librarians, and so I really appreciate that. Um, and then the last question that I had is, how does the equity index um, inform the outreach um, for the community conversations? Carla, do you want to go ahead? Yes. So the index, the equity index, is actually applied for very uh, different scenarios that we might be using. One of the most recent. Um, ways that we were utilized that first for digital inclusion and trying to assess where the digital needs were, were concentrated highest in making sure that our outreach um, prioritized those neighborhoods to try to identify the local service providers and the trusted community voices in those particular areas and making sure that we were devising a plan to engage them to spread the word, to share flyers, to connect with them, to see if we could um, stop by and do an outreach tour, for example, to check out mobile hotspots on, in that area. So that is one of the ways in which we look at the digital equity index, look at the concentrations of needs, and then use that to inform who should we be partnering with? How can we get mm. that word spread out? Or where do we post flyers, for example? And, and you might have seen the banners at certain schools uh, as you're driving around promoting um, our, our, our SJ access equipment. And that is all guided and informed mm -hmm. by the equity index. So mm -hmm. as we continue to collect more data and to um, look into uh, how, who we're reaching in our programming and where there are gaps, so where we could uh, um, reach uh, more community members, that is the way in which it can inform um, which kind, what, who we could uh, concentrate our efforts in, in spreading the word. 
Wonderful, wonderful. And and I'm going to uh, bring in the same um, um, idea that I had uh, earlier with um, um, Sulma about uh, aligning some of the work that we're doing elsewhere with with this the, this work or any of the work. I know Angel does a great deal of this trying to intersect everything, right? So that we're leveraging the resources that we have. So I'm going to go back to the promotoras model and think and ask you uh, to reflect on that and how that model um, can get incorporated, aligned with what you're doing. It sounds like. Um, you know, you're using your data, you, you have your folks who are coming in. Uh, um, it, it, it sounds like you're just well into this process. And so it'd be wonderful to see how the promotoras model can, can be incorporated or, um, you, know, uh, you know, be a meaningful part of this uh, um, effort. Um, but, but that's something that you can take back with Angel and, and figure that, that piece out. Um, in the meantime, congratulations uh, coming uh, this far. Uh, thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing, Carla, and taking that lead, um, that leadership role. And uh, Jill, thank you for, for that, you know, valuing the, this aspect of the work that we do um, uh, because everybody else could be uh, doing just a tremendous amount of work elsewhere right there's endless endless work so thank you for for your level of commitment um through staff and resources i really appreciate it um and i know that more importantly our community is going to re is recognizing and appreciating which is ultimately what we want that that the services at the library make sense to them and so when i heard you say that people can join once you know if you're late um, or you can max out a little bit more. You don't have to, there, there isn't a, a cap there for, for some of the groups or reading groups uh, for our families. That makes a lot of sense, especially, you know, for us working moms <laughs> that, that, uh, that want to do a lot of uh, at the same time. And so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think that Michelle's comment, you know, is to the fact that we always have practices in organizations that make a lot of sense to us at the time. But that, you know, over time, she was referencing all these ways in which we recognize that it didn't need to be that way. And it actually helps people be more uh, involved or removes yeah. barriers. We change our practice. And, you know, when you were asking a question at a previous item, it actually uh, really made me realize you asked about, um, are there any practices that have been, have had, a, you know, have been like racist uh, or an over, uh, you know, negative impact on communities of color? And um, you, may, you, you know that, and Michelle mentioned this, that for the library, the levy of fines, um, historically, right. we did a big analysis and found that um, unpaid fines were very clearly disproportionately impacting children and mm -hmm. communities of color. And so we had a system that, that needed to change and thankfully with, but it had a very big budget impact. Mm -hmm. So thankfully with the, council support and our city manager support and our advocates, our commission, um, that has changed. We no longer have youth fines and uh, we have suspended adult fines during COVID. So we're continuing to find ways to, to mitigate uh, practices that made a lot of sense at one time, but they have disproportionate impacts and they need to change. I appreciate that. And we can work off those, uh, those fines, um, which allows us for a way out. We always need a way out. Right. So, so thank you so much, Jill, for, for that wonderful work, Carla, um, and Michelle, uh, it, it's just, we're full of race and equity today at NSC and it just feels really good, which is, it feels like this is the way, this is the path. This is how we should, uh, we should be, uh, conducting business, um, you know, from, from the start. So, um, if we could have a, a motion, we can conclude this item. I'll move approval. Wonderful. I'll second. second. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Council Member Sparza. Okay, let's uh, call roll on this. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Cohen? Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we're going to move to our last item, which is um, public forum. Oh, oh, excuse me, open forum um, and go ahead. 
Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks a lot for the meeting today. It was really interesting. Um, a reminder that, you know, with all the new law enforcement questions at this time, you know, it's my real hope that it, it's our openness, open public policies, our accountability, our good ideas of reimagine, racial equity, and health and human services that uh, can really help out naturally to law enforcement questions at this time. And I, I think it can organize ourselves and the law enforcement questions very well. Open public policies and accountability can really, really help with that, I feel. Good luck how digital inclusion ideas can be a future that can walk hand in hand with open public policies and accountability. Um, to quickly mention again, uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings, uh, you know, and the language interpretation issues seems like, you know, they're, they're so expensive because they're supporting the concepts of English only in our society. We've all made agreements to this English only policy that's been developed since the 1980s. And I think we're all growing uncomfortable with the policy. I really hope the equity roundtable can, can you know, make attempts to study this question and, and the fact that multiculturalism and language at the public meeting process at this point can actually develop a better community, a more a harmonious community, good process where everybody learns, everybody has rights and, and works better, I feel. It's, it can be a better system at this point. I hope we can have study sessions on this English only problem at uh, the equity round table. Um, and to conclude, um, I, I really hope that we can work on the consent calendar uh, wording that I think we took the really wrong direction at this time. The city charter process has brought ourselves a bunch of new study questions and good ideas. Let's work to make it an inclusive process that can still respect the council can have a motion uh, process when the public asks for consent calendar items. And let's work on the meeting minutes. Jill Borders. Thank you. I just want to plant a small seed. Um, sort of has to do with equity for me. Some people may not think so, but um, for example, the affordable housing units that are going to be built along Blossom Hill Road or anywhere else, generally, my understanding is they're built as you know inexpensively as possible according to codes. So when I went and listened to the meeting uh, about this project, there's going to be um, a washroom on the lower floor. Um, and they were talking about how great the washroom, the laundry room was because it was right next to the playground. So that, and, that, and as was she explained to me, so that as the women are watching their children, they can do their laundry. And I wanna express in, in, in very strong terms, I understand it costs money to put a washer and dryer in every unit. But when we are talking about the problems of equity, here's what I, my thoughts are. You have all these market rate things where this one person lives that can pay $3,500 a month, can go drop off dry clean, have somebody launder their stuff and all kinds of stuff, whatever. But they also have a washer and dryer. And then you have lower income people, mothers who are working almost every single day. And on the day off they get, they got to drag all their laundry down with the kid on their hip to do laundry. And I've done it. And it's hard. And it's hard because your kid may be taking a nap. Nope, they got to get up. You got to switch the laundry. They may throw up in the middle of the night. You don't have a washing machine. So you gather up all the throw up sheets and you put them in the corner waiting for the next day, hoping your neighbors don't notice that your throw up is going into the same washing machine that you're putting yours in. So I want to say that in the future, I hope every single building is built with equity in mind, which is that time is money. And these women mostly, and men do laundry too, but mostly women are caring for children, doing their laundry in a very difficult circumstance while other people are just throwing it in in the middle of the night if they feel like it. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you, everyone. Well, that is the end of our NSC uh, committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. Council Member Arenas, Paul Soto did put his hand up right when oh. we Right okay, where's... we will hear him. Absolutely. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, thank you for that. I got the cheap Metro phone. Sometimes this thing, the 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 the, the light goes off. But uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe, and I mean this with 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 all sincerity, uh, Councilwoman Arenas, I really appreciated your acknowledgement for what I do and what I bring here. Um, people don't really understand what my role is here. 
and you and Councilwoman uh, Esparza, um, despite the fact that I, I have some very serious concerns about the direction that she's going with, uh, with respect to uh, things happening in her district, um, I appreciate the way that she absolutely accurately centered why I say, because when I say I'm from the horseshoe, I'm saying a lot. That neighborhood, Perales, gave the horseshoe to District 6. District 6 were the authors, the literal authors. I have all the documents, their names. They were the authors of the redlining map. Bebrack Park, Bebrack lived on Downless Street. Bebrack was the mayor of San Jose from 1930 to 1932. Willow Glen was annexed into San Jose eight months before that redlining map was ratified and made legal. This is a problem right there, right there. I don't have the opportunity to articulate that whole argument. It's got to be a legal argument, and it's going to be, because that the redlining map, it's going to court. It's going to court for that reason, and I'm going to be the one to fight that, because you don't give Willow Glen, and they were the authors of the redlining map, and I have the proof. So for them to exercise that kind of power, and for Perales to think he can give them that, Put the, put put the red line, basically the 87 that went through and the 280, he created the lines out of the red line. I mean, this is sick. So it's going to court and Perales, he just better give that donor money. Back to the committee. All right, well, thank you everyone. This uh, concludes our meeting. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day.